Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we are on our uh, 20th session on Hell Revealed. And um, I think uh, this there'll be one more lesson after this, inshallah. So we'll be completing it next week, inshallah. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala al-mab'uuthi rahmatan lil alameen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallama tasliman kathiran ila yawmiddin amma ba'd. So we are discussing the verse, wa in minkum illa wariduha. So there's actually two opinions, a few opinions about what exactly that means is does that mean people will just pass because it says that every one of you is going to come to it, which means hellfire? Does that mean that people will have to actually enter it as well? I know so far the way we've discussed it, it means it's just passed over it. The believers will just pass over it. They won't have to enter inside. Uh, the sinners will have to enter inside and then come out. However, there are a few other opinions which go to uh, show that uh, maybe there is the idea that you'll have to go inside it. So we're just going to look at the various different narrations. Uh, regarding that, it gives us an idea of how things will transpire on that day. So for example, there's a hadith that Imam Muslim has transmitted from Jabir radiallahu anhu. He says that Umm Bishr uh, told him, informed him that he heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying while he was with Hafsa radiallahu anha, لا يدخل النار إن شاء الله من أصحاب الشجرة أحد من الذين بايعوا تحتها. That if Allah subhanahu wa taala wills, nobody from the people of the tree, أصحاب الشجرة, those who took the pledge under the tree, none of those people will have to enter hellfire. Those who took the pledge under the tree, none of them, if Allah wills, will not have to enter the hellfire. So it's kind of ambiguous. That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, then they don't have to enter the hellfire. So it goes to show that others will enter hellfire if this is a special kind of uh, discretion for the people, of, uh, the people who took the pledge with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Hafsa radiallahu anha said, وَإِن مِّنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then read uh, verse of Surah Maryam, verse 72, ثُمَّ نُنَجِّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ وَنَظَرُ الظَّالِمِينَ فِيهَا جِثِيَّا then we're going to deliver and give safety to those who have fear. And it's the oppressors that we're going to leave in there. So again, I don't think it's really clear cut and explicit that you'll have to actually enter inside it. It could be that they come very close to it and so on or pass over it. Uh, I'm just going to mention the various narrations. Shows that there's a bit of ambiguity where it looks like the strong opinion is that you just pass by it. Jabir radiallahu anha. Um, there's another one in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that they will come to it. And then after that, they'll be able to go away from it. With their deeds. Or due to their deeds. So the words used is, يَرِدُونَهَا ثُمَّ يَصْدُرُونَ عَنْهَا وَيَصْدِرُونَ عَنْهَا Wurud means to come to a place, especially water. And sudur means to go beyond, go, go away from it. Another group says, no, they have to wurud. Wa in minkum illa wariduha, as Allah says in the Quran. That concept of warid, which means to come, wurud means entry. So it's not just passed over. It's not just a passing over, it's actually entry. And this is actually a view that's also understood from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu which has been transmitted from him. Where he gets that from, I think, is in Surah Uhud, uh, verse 90, uh, 98. Allah says, يَقْدُمُ النَّارِ Talking about Pharaoh, that he's going to come ahead of his people and he's going to enter them into hellfire. So the word used is awrad, wurud, same idea, irad. And irad means not just pass by there, but he'll actually enter them into hellfire. So that's where they're getting it from. Another verse, Surah Maryam, verse 86. وَنَسُوقُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ إِلَىٰ جَهَنَّمَ وِرْدًا We are going to drive the mischief makers, the sinners, the, the criminals to Jahannam. Wirda. Why would we drive them to Jahannam just to be around there? Uh, wirdan must mean enter them into it, 
to enter into it, to have them go into it. Likewise, Surah Al-Anbiya, لَوْ كَانَ هَؤُلَاءِ آلِهَةً مَا وَرَدُوهَا If they had lords, then they would not have entered it. So the concept of wurud is used in the Quran in the meaning of entry. That's where he takes it from. It's also tra- similar kind of ideas also transmitted from some others like Imam Mujahid as well. وَيْمِنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا قَالَ الدَّاخِلُهَا Which means enter into it. Ka'b al-Ahbar, he was asked about this. And he said, the hellfire will stay away from people. So it seems like what he's trying to say is that hellfire, he says, hellfire will stay away from people until those who are crossing the bridge or whatever it is are able to get a footing. And there's going to be good people there. There's going to be bad people trying to cross. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to say to the hellfire, خُذِي أَصْحَابَكِ You can now seize the people you need to seize. But وَدَعِي أَصْحَابِ Leave alone my companions, meaning those who are my people. So that's when every person who's designated for hellfire will collapse inside. There'll literally be a collapse and they'll just collapse inside hellfire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give, give safety to the believers. So you've, it, obviously this is something about the hereafter. And I think the main thing that we have to understand is that what makes the big difference here is our deeds. So inshallah, whatever the details are, the main thing is that... Now, it says in another narration that hellfire will be more knowledgeable regarding its people, meaning the ones that are supposed to be deemed to be in hellfire. It's, it has their names. It knows exactly who they are, and it, it's, it will just um, seize those people. Uh, it says that it is more knowledgeable about them and recognizes them more than a father would recognize his child. That, that, that's 100% information. Okay. Abu Sumayya, he says once, we, had a, you know, we were differing with regards to this idea that are we going to have to actually go inside or is it just passing over? Some, are, some of them are saying, okay, whatever it is, the believer doesn't have to go inside. Some are saying, now everybody's going to have to go inside, but the believer's then going to be given safety. Right? Because Allah says it in the Quran, so it's that wurud, that idea of wariduha, they're taking it literally. But then, even if you go inside, you're still going to come out of it. It's a very technical discussion. At the end of the day, if you're going to be safe from it, alhamdulillah. Right? That's, that's really what matters. So, then he says, we had that difference of opinion. I met Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, the Sahabi. So I said to him that, look, you know, we've had some difference of opinion about this among my friends or whatever. So he said, yes, everybody's going to, he uses the word, yaridunaha, the wurud word again, right? So Sulaim ibn Murrah says, enter it, that they will actually enter it. That's what wurud means. They will actually enter it. And then he said, I actually heard the Prophet sallallahu saying that all good and bad people will enter it. None of, but none of them will be left without entering it. So actually here it's the most explicit word we got so far from the Prophet sallallahu that no good or bad person will be remaining except that they will have to enter it. However, and this is a really new information here, and it's a hadith of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. He says, except that for the believers, the fire will become bardan wa salaman, will become cool and a place of safety, just like it was for Ibrahim when he was thrown into the fire of the world. Such that it will be so cool that the fire will actually complain because of the coolness is maybe spoiling it or um, spoiling its heat. And that's why Allah says in Surah Maryam, We're going to give safety to those who have taqwa and we're going to ab- or leave in there the oppressors in there. Right? Wallahu alam. Wallahu alam. Then there's a hadith of Sahih Bukhari Muslim from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu that the Prophet said, any believer, any Muslim, 
for whom three of their children die. So if somebody's lost three children, there's a special virtue for them. Says that anybody like that, hellfire will not touch them. Except just to fulfill the oath. The oath that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made that people will enter. It, uh, people who have lost three children, this is a huge virtue for them because psychologically that's a major disaster. It's a really, really something that really causes a lot of grief. So they've got something to look out for. That's what religion is supposed to provide. You're supposed to be able to deal uh, with these kind of issues in the world. And that's exactly what Islam does. So he's saying that they, they will have to also enter hellfire, but just to fulfill the oath that you've entered, not really to be punished therein. There's another one. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, Man mata, whoever has three children die, who had not become mature. So even children who die, not just in miscarriages or anything like that, not miscarriages, but actually speaking about who die at young age before they become mature, that they will only enter the hellfire like the person who's passing by somewhere. So not somebody who's going to stay in there. Then there's another narration from Anas radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever protected, gave protection. Whoever stood in protection, gave protection or security to the backs of, the, you know, to, to a Muslim contingent in the path of Allah, mutatawian, not as a job, but free, voluntarily. You know, he wasn't appointed by any leader or the commander or whatever. He will also not enter the hellfire except just to fulfill the oath, just to fulfill the idea that he has, you know, people have to enter. Because Allah says, look, everyone has to enter. So it'll be just for that, but they won't be punished therein. So we're learning about ways to get out of it. However, others says that, yes, the word seems to be general, the verse seems to be general, but it's obviously referring to those who will want, uh, who will have to go into hellfire. فَوَرَبِّكَ لَنَحْشُرَنَّهُمْ وَالشَّيَاطِينَ ثُمَّ لَنُحْضِرَنَّهُمْ حَوْلَ جَهَنَّمَ جِثِيَّ So some are saying that this actually is not a universally applied idea. It's not for everyone. It's actually, if you read before in Surah Maryam, Allah says, فَوَرَبِّكَ لَنَحْشُرَنَّهُمْ وَالشَّيَاطِينَ ثُمَّ لَنُحْضِرَنَّهُمْ حَوْلَ جَهَنَّمَ جِثِيَّ ثُمَّ لَنُنَجِّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقَوْا then it says, So, this, every one of you will enter into it, actually refers to the bad people, not the good people. So that's a third way of looking at this. Because Allah says, By your Lord, we will surely gather them and the shaitans. Then we will make them present around Jahannam. That's why Ikrimah, he used to also read, وَإِن مِّنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا And he used to say, what this refers to are the oppressors, not the believers. So anyway, I think that gives us enough understanding of this. Right, we move on to another section here. Uh, another bit of detail. When people on the Day of Judgment will be standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hellfire will be present. And that will be what's terrorizing them or adding to their terror and all the other concern and worry that they have. That's why the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned that a, serve, uh, a slave of Allah, when he stands between, uh, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the reckoning, fire, the fire, the jahannam will be there in front of him, just waiting for him. Then the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned, this is really interesting and may Allah allow us to increase in this, is that it's sadaqah, voluntary charity, paying in the path of Allah, that protects its people from the hellfire. It's a massive, it's very effective. That's why there's a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim from Adi ibn Hatim, radiallahu anhu, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, it's a very famous narration, some of you probably heard it as well, every one of you will be such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will speak to him, Directly. 
There's going to be no interpreter in between. Allah will know exactly what you're saying. You'll understand what Allah is saying. The person will look to his right. And the only thing that he will see are the deeds. So that's all will come to his vision, to his sight, his deeds only. Then he'll look to his left. And exactly whatever he sent forth, that's all he'll see. It's just going to all be about him. Right? Everything is done. Basically the whole Facebook history or YouTube history or whatever it is, that whatever we've done, it's all going to be there. And then he's going to look in front. So right and left is the deeds, uh, all the records. In front is going to be hellfire. What a formidable sight that's going to be the incriminating evidence on right and left and hellfire in front. Well, it doesn't have to be incriminating. It could be, uh, mashallah, rewarding if it's good, inshallah. Inshallah. Then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "So fear the fire, even if with half a date. So even if half a date is going to help you, if it's somebody else's, and you're trying to usurp that from them, you consume somebody else's, or I don't know, you can maybe even take this as give half a date in the path of a life. That's all you've got for sadaqa. Sahih Muslim, another narration." The Prophet ﷺ said that من استطاع منكم أن يستطير من النار ولو بشك تمرة فليفعل Whoever has the ability to protect himself, veil himself from the hellfire, even if with half a date, then do so. Then there's another narration from Abdul Rahman ibn Samura رضي الله عنه. The Prophet ﷺ once one day came out and said, "At night, I've seen something really, really astonishing." And amazing. And he mentioned a very long narration. In it, I mean, just the relevant part here is that he said, I saw one person from my ummah try, pr- trying to put up his hands or whatever to protect himself from the flames and everything of the hellfire. And, you know, he's like just trying to protect himself. His sadaqa comes along, his charity comes along, and it became a veil. Like, you got a, you got a veil here. Uh, on his head and it basically created a canopy for him so a source of protection for him so sadaqa is very very powerful may Allah give us more tawfiq to, uh, to, to do sadaqa right we move on to another section now there's a few just very relevant sections as he finishes the book now um, the next one is regarding how will, be the, how will believers be in hellfire? Now, we've had glimpses of that uh, in our discussions, but how, the believers who are sent to hellfire, what is their state going to be? What exactly is kind of their punishment? How much punishment, etc.? And then it also speaks a bit about shafa'a, intercession. Whose intercession is going to be useful to get people, to get people out? Now, as we've mentioned, we've mentioned a number of narrations about this. There's going to be people who will pass by. They won't have to enter at all. And then there's going to be others who's going to, who are going to have to go inside. And uh, there's going to be people who will pass by and they'll wonder where their friends are. There used to be people who were in their group, in their class that they used to attend. They don't see those people. They've maybe met up with a number of their friends, but they don't see... You know, Yusuf and Ahmed and Musa and, you know, and so on. So they find out that they're in the hellfire, that they've gone into hellfire. So they're going to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take them out. So now let's look at a narration from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. And this is a long narration. I'll just mention a part of it. So he says, Allah, uh, the, Allah's messenger said, by the one in whose hand is my life, um, None of you are going to be more, you can say, petitioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding, uh, sorry, than the, those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment for their brothers to take them out of hellfire. So believers are the best people you want to be with because they are those who, if they get to paradise, they'll help you out. They will say, our Lord, they used to fast with us. كانوا يصومون معنا. They used to pray with us. They've done Hajj with us. Subhanallah. So then it's going to be uh, 
said to them, okay, whoever you know, whoever you recognize, go and take them out. And then Allah will make their faces, those people who they're trying to take out, their faces will be made haram on the fire. So I guess they'll be recognized. So they'll be able to be taken out. So these people go and take out a lot of people, right? Because they had a group of, they were in a group of 150 people in Hajj, maybe, right? The people that used to fast and they used to do iftar together in the masjid was, you know, 300 people. They used to pray Jummah with, you know, a thousand people, subhanAllah. And among these people who they take out, some of those people, the fire would have gripped them uh, to their shins, some of them, some to their knees, right? So they're in some kind of punishment there. Not maybe fully, but they're in some kind of punishment. Now they will come back and say, our Lord, everybody that you told us we could take out, they're out now. Right, we've taken all of those people out that we could. So then Allah will say, go back. Allah's in, mashallah, that eventually, right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be in this really good mood as such, like really generous nature. So he's going to say, go back and anybody that you see, you find the amount of a dinar in their heart of goodness, you can take them out as well. So again, they'll go back and they'll take a lot of people out. Then say, our Lord, we've not left anybody like that inside. Everybody's out. La ilaha illallah. So then he'll say, go back and now you find anybody with even half the weight of a dinar, amount of goodness, you can take them out. Now, you're saying that you can take a dinar amount and now half a dinar amount, it means they're going to be really given this kind of measure that anybody you see with this much, they can go out. Anybody you see, okay, with that less, they're going to have some kind of insight to figure this out, right? So they're going to go and take out a lot, then they're going to come back and say the same thing. We've taken everyone like that out. There's nobody with that much. Then Allah will say, okay, now I want you to go back and see anybody even with an atom weight of gold. Dharra, like something small, extremely small. Whatever that smallness is, we'll just make it as small as possible. All right? So they will go and take a lot more people out. And then they'll come and say the same thing that we've done. It. We've done what you've said. Now, Abu Sa'id is the narrator of this hadith. He says, if you don't believe me about this narration that I heard from the Prophet وسلم, I'll give you from the Quran. Read, if you want, read from the Quran. This verse proves it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not oppress anybody even to the amount, infinitesimally small particle amount. So can you see how that corroborates? If it's that much goodness even, Allah will increase it. And He will give from Himself a huge, huge, magnificent amount of reward anyway. Surah An-Nisa verse 40. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then say, Abu Sa'id Qudir carried on the narration. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then say that the angels have interceded, meaning they've gone and taken people out. Uh, the prophets have done so. The believers have done so. Now, only the Arhamur Rahimin is left. The most merciful of the merciful ones, he's the only one who's left, which is Allah. He, has to do, he wants to do something as well. Like, I gave you the ability to do all of this. Now, so he is going to take a handful of the people of hellfire. And by that, there will be those who've never done any good. They had belief, but they were just never done any good. Until now, the people were taking out those who had done a bit of good. Helped out somebody, uh, made some extra dhikr, right? These are people who've probably just made the kalima once and, and never did it again. They just, in fact, they just believed, right? They had the right belief, that's it. يُخْرِجُ بِهَا قَوْمًا لَمْ يَعْمَلُوا خَيْرًا قَدْتُ Take out a people from there who've never done any good at all. Qad'adu humaman. They've literally become like cinders, blackened in hellfire. Allah will have them dipped into the, these lakes, these streams. Uh, this lake that will be uh, just at the entrance of Jannah, which is called the lake of 
life, Nahrul Hayat, the lake of life. And mashallah, they'll come out of there after they've been dipped. Uh, the way the Prophet ﷺ explained it is when you have a deluge and a flood, whatever soil that remains afterwards is extremely fertile. It brings out the most fertile soil. You plant anything and then it just grows, right? Like super soil. So this will be like that. They will come out just like the seeds just erupt and grow in this super method. Hadith reported by Bukhari and Muslim, etc. La ilaha illallah. So what does he mean by those who've never done any good? He means they've not done any good with their limbs. They just had belief, that's it. They just not had done any good. So the people earlier would have taken those out who had done some good with their, with their limbs, prayed or whatever it is. These people just had tawheed. They just declared the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why. There's another narration from Anas radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, so then I will say, my Lord, give me permission for those who've said la ilaha illallah. So after all of those other people who've been taken out, who've done some good deeds, even if it's infinitesimally small good deeds. Now let me take out those who've just said la ilaha illallah once. They've not done any other good deed, those people. Allah will say, by my might and my majesty and my greatness and my uh, grandeur, I will take out, that's for me, I will take out those who just said once, La ilaha illallah. In a Muslim's narration, it says, that's not for, that's not for you guys. That's my job. That's the last thing I want to do. Take out all of those who've said, La ilaha illallah. So, the intercession will be for those who've done some good, at least. Uh, intercession from prophets or uh, believers. But those who will come out without intercession has to come out from Allah, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. He'll do that directly and Allah knows best. These are the very promising narrations. Now, there's a, several narrations about this showing how the events will transpire. In another one it says that Allah will tell the angels to go and remove from the hellfire those who've never done shirk with Allah, never impartnered anybody with Allah, but who went into the hellfire, how are they going to be recognized? يُعْرَفُونَ بِأَثَرِ sujood. These people, meaning whoever's been a believer and has prayed something, never done shirk, they're going to be recognized by the places of their prostration. That means the forehead, the palms, the knees, and the, the, the toes, feet, right? Those, people, the, those places cannot be touched by the hellfire. Are right? going to be protected? Now, the rest of their body seems like they're completely uh, burnt up. They're going to be, uh, they're going to have this water of life um, poured over them and they're going to grow in there just like has been described. Another hadith of Muslim, this just shows you the exceptions for this, right? From Jabir radiallahu the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there'll be a people who will come out of hellfire, who would have been absolutely burnt in there. So their whole, fire, uh, whole body is burnt, except darati wujuhihim, except the circumference of their face. Their faces will not be touched. We get that from the sujood. If the forehead is not touched, the whole face will not be touched. Hadda yadkhulun jannah until they'll enter paradise. Abu Sa'id radiallahu anh has another hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, as far as the people of hellfire are, meaning those who are from the hellfire, they're not going to die and neither are they going to be fully alive. We've read that before. They're going to be in that punished state. But there's going to be another group of people who have been seized by the fire because of their sins or their mistakes, right? But they're believers. So then it says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make them die in there. So they're gonna, not going to be alive at all. So they won't feel anything. But they will get burnt out. They will be completely burnt out like cinders. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to allow intercession. So they're going to be brought group by group, as we've read earlier, as we just discussed. They're going to be sent to be dipped in this, uh, these lakes of, uh, of paradise. And then it's going to be said to the people of paradise, you pour over them as well, like you assist. So pour your water over them. 
and then they're going to grow and they're going to become better better than they've ever been actually there's another narration that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that this this is all about this chapter is all about those people who are believers who've had to enter hellfire that the people who are doing major sins from those who used to believe in uh, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they die upon their major sins without having repented without being uh, without having remorse or repentance right whoever so then they're going to have to enter hellfire possibly right uh, whoever enters hellfire from them, from that first door of hellfire, their eyes will not become blue. This is eyes becoming blue out of fright, just losing color, I guess, the darkness. Their faces aren't going to become dark. They're not going to be shackled by the shayateen. They're not going to be shackled or chained or anything like that. They're not going to be forced to drink the boiling water. They're not going to be clothed in tar, right, from the hellfire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually made it haram for them to remain permanently in the hellfire just because of their tawheed. La ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. So all of these benefits. And Allah has also prohibited. Uh, and made unlawful their faces upon the hellfire because of the sujood, prostrations they would do. Start praying, start praying. Don't mess with your prayers, man. That is just one thing no believer can do. I, I, I just find it so, so weird and so difficult to believe that, you know, when sometimes you're with the, those you know are Muslim and they can just easily miss a prayer. Flimsiest excuses, I just can't believe it. Like, you just wonder, like, what is the level of Iman if you have to... I can understand somebody's, you know, where you're going past and you see something on the ground which may bother somebody, so you don't move it out of the way. That's a sign of Iman. That's the lowest branch of Iman is to move away things that will, you know, cause inconvenience and harm to someone. You move those out of the way. That's the lowest branch of Iman. I, I can kind of understand that. But I can't understand when somebody just doesn't pray. Like, why don't they pray? Just can't understand that. So all you're told to do is pray five times a day. But they have like an aversion to prayer. It's like almost like everybody's praying, but they go and sit in a corner. It's like, it's not even culture. Like everybody there is praying except them. Like who's going to see? It's actually worse that you don't pray and you get questioned. SubhanAllah. Allah make it easy. Allah make it easy. So, it says that they, all of these people, they're Ahlul Tawheed, Ahlul Tawheed, right? Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to make haram their faces on the hellfire because of the prostration they would do. But then some of those, they've been taken by the f uh, uh, hellfire to their shins and their knees and so on, right? And some to their, just their feet, just their feet are in hellfire. Some are up to their waist and some are higher up, up to their neck, just their faces are not. This is dependent on their actions. There's going to be, then it says, there's going to be some among them who are going to stay there for a month. Then they're going to come out. That month is going to look very long. And then there's going to be some who are going to be there for a year. Then they'll be allowed to come out. The longest of them, like the worst of them who's going to stay there, the longest is going to be the one who stays there for the amount of the world. The duration of the existence of this world from the day that Allah created this world to when He is going to end this world. I don't know, that's going to be a few million, you know, several million. I don't know how, what the calculation is. They come up with new calculations about that, but several million. That's going to be what it is. Starting from a month to that much. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to come out, I said, as long as there's even that amount, billion years, there's something to look forward to. Still better than not coming out at all. La ilaha illallah. Now the Yahud and the Nasara and the others who are in the hellfire from other religions and uh, uh, idol worshippers and so on, they're going to have said already to the people who used to believe in the oneness of Allah, right, throughout 
the generations and the previous prophets and so on, right? They're going to say to them, you believed in Allah and His books and His messengers and we were, but, but now we're together in hellfire. Like we've all ended up here. You used to believe, we never believed. Right? But you've all, you know, we've all ended up here, so what's the point? Like we're all in here together now. Allah then is going to get very angry. That's going to raise his, you know, his anger. He says he's not ang- become angry like this for anything before this. La ilaha illallah. So then Allah is going to take them out. He doesn't want the, disbelie- the, the, the others to say that to them. So he's going to take them out to those springs of paradise. And this is Surah Al-Hijr verse 2. This is what Allah is speaking about. رُبَمَا يَوَدُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ كَانُوا مُسْلِمِينَ when the disbelievers will start thinking, uh, will start, would, would have hoped that they had been Muslims. Because they've just messed around with them and saying, look, you're all together, your belief didn't help you or whatever, and then suddenly they're taken out. La ilaha illallah. This is a hadith narrated by Ibn Abi Hatim and some others. So there's another narration from Hassan. He says that the people of uh, Tawheed will not be shackled in hellfire. So, the guardians of hellfire, they don't know why. They just think everybody should be shackled in there. So they're going to say, what's wrong with these guys? How come they got a special privilege? So then an announcement is going to be made saying that these are those who used to walk in the darknesses of the night to the masajid. Subhanallah. These are the people who, are, who used to walk to the masjids in the darknesses of the night. So that's your Salatul Isha and Salatul Fajr. And probably the other prayers if you're up north somewhere where the sun does not rise for a few months. Subhanallah. Because I guess once it gets dark, you just want to sit at home. Right? Uh, Isha is late. Fajr is too early. May Allah make it easy. Hassan Basri, rahimahullah, he was saying, that there's going to be a man who will eventually, after a thousand years, come out of hellfire. And he says, how I wish I'll be that man. Meaning, if I want to gamble it, I don't mind by being even that man. Of course, any better than that, alhamdulillah. But at least that man, even after a thousand years, you eventually get out. The next section is regarding having good hope in Allah. Because having good hope in Allah, when it means having good hope in Allah, is not to become despondent and do your best and have hope. So do your best and have hope. Not this false hope where you don't do anything like, oh, it's okay, he's my buddy, he'll sort me out. This means having hope after doing whatever we can do. We know it's broken. We know it's defective. We know we have shortcomings, but we do our best. And we hope the best from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will forgive us. So, it says... Ahmad ibn Abil Huwari, Huwara, he says that I once went to meet Abu Sulaiman, probably Abu Sulaiman al Darani, and he was crying. What's making you cry? So he's saying, look, this is his way of dealing with it. These are, you can just say, creative ways. This is not from a hadith, but this is just their understanding from what they know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Quran and Sunnah. So, these are their ideas and they're very helpful for us. And anybody can have their own ideas of how they want to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or respond to Him. This is what he said. He said, if I am demanded or taken to account for my sin, I'm going to demand from Him His forgiveness. If, they demand, if I'm demanded for my miserliness, I will demand from Allah, from His generosity. He knows Allah is generous. He knows Allah is the forgiving one. So he wants to call out to Allah from his name. Okay, you can call me miserly. You can call me sinful. But you are the forgiver. And you are the generous one. So he kind of turns it around. If I am entered into hellfire, I'm going to tell all the people in hellfire that I used to love Allah. I'm going to tell all the people of hellfire that I used to love Allah. Salman ibn al-Hakam ibn Awana says that there was a man... In Arafat, in Arafat, he made a dua. This was his dua. These are just, you can say, 
quirky, interesting, intelligent, spiritual du'as that people have made up for themselves. Ya Allah. He says, لا تعذبنا بالنار. Do not punish us. He's going to say to Allah, don't punish uh, Well, no, actually he was making this du'a on Arafat. He says, Ya Allah, don't punish us with the fire after you have allowed your tawheed and your declaration of oneness you've allowed that to be settled in our heart. How can you f- punish us with the fire when we've got tawheed in our hearts? And then he started crying. Then he said, uh, what do I know what you're going to do with your forgiveness? And then he cried again. Then he says, whatever you do, but don't, because of our sin, combine us and gather us with the people who have been oppressors that we used to be enemies with for your sake. So whatever you do, fine. But don't bring us together with those same people that we used to be displeased with and enemies with because of you. Don't bring us together. Hakim ibn Jabir says, Ibrahim used to make this dua, Oh Allah, do not bring together those who commit shirk and those who do not commit shirk. Never let them be together. Ibn Abi Dunya says, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, whenever he would read the verse of Surah Al-Nahl, verse 38, وَأَقَسَمُوا بِاللَّهِ جَهْدَ أَيْمَانِهِمْ لَمْ يَبْعَ وَأَقَسَمُوا بِاللَّهِ جَهْدَ أَيْمَانِهِمْ لَا يَبْعَثُ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَمُوتُ They used to swear by Allah, you know, emphasizing their oaths that Allah is not going to resurrect those who used to die, who, who, will, who will die. They were like so sure about it. Whenever he would read that, he would say, and we swear by Allah, emphasizing our oaths, that Allah will resurrect those who die. Then he said, do you think he's going to now put those two people kind of together, those who used to emphasize that it's not going to happen, those who said it is going to happen? Then he would cry a lot. This is Umar radiallahu anhu. He would cry a lot. There, there was like, you can tell by this that there's like one thing or the other. And there must be so many things that we've heard. There's going to be something that's just going to stick with us and bother us. So they used to discuss it like that. There's another narration from Abu Nu'im, from Aoun ibn Abdullah. He says that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has removed us from evil, He's not going to bring us back into evil afterwards. If he's taken us out of haram and wrongs and evil, why is he going to bring us back into evil, meaning hellfire? Because look, we used to be, as Allah says in the Quran, وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَى شَفَا حُفْرَةٍ مِّنَ النَّارُ فَأَنْقَذَكُمْ مِّنْهَا Surah Ali Imran, verse 103. And you were on the, the absolute edge of the, of the fire. Like you were going to fall in. But we saved you from it. So those people, how is Allah is not going to bring together two different people of hellfire who said, وَأَقْسَمُوا بِاللَّهِ جَهَدَيْمُ لَا يَبْعَثُ اللَّهُ مَيُّمْ Those who uh, actually you know, used to believe that resurrection, is, they used to claim that resurrection and swear that resurrection will not occur. Whereas we believe that, we, we swear that it will occur. Muhammad ibn Ishaq al-Sarraj says all the way to Ibn al-Sammak who said that once Harun al-Rashid the Abbasid Khalif called me and he said say something and make some dua these were this is what they used to do they used to bring in different awliya and say look give me some nasih give me some counsel and advice and make some dua for us so he says, I made a dua that he really, really liked. So I said in my dua, Oh Allah, you are the one who've said that they swore their very strong oaths that Allah is not going to resurrect anybody who dies. So, Oh Allah, we swear by you, by emphasizing our oaths, that you are going to resurrect those who die. So, my Lord, are you then going to bring those two, these two types of people in one place? 
and Harun was crying. <sighs> La ilaha illallah. I think if you take anything from the Quran and you discuss it like that and you personalize it to our self and talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will help. Is about something that we've covered before in the paradise lectures. It's about who are the majority dwellers of hellfire? Who are the majority of those who will enter the hellfire? Okay. So, there's a hadith from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu. People of hellfire that are from there, they're not going to die or be alive in there. They're going to be the majority. Meaning the permanent dwellers of hellfire, they're going to be the majority in there. They're going to be more than the disobedient believers, the disobedient uh, declarers of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who are eventually going to be cleansed and taken out and cleansed and purified and regrown and, you know, they're going to be entered into paradise. So we have a hadith in which Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment will say, Ya Adam, he will say, Labbaik wa Sa'daik, at your service, Ya Allah. So then there's going to be an announcement which is going to say, Allah has told you that you can go and take out the contingent of the hellfire. You set them aside who are the contingent of hellfire from your descendants, those people who are supposed to go to hellfire. So he's going to say to Allah, what is this contingent of hellfire? How much? Who are these people? So everybody's there. You must take out and separate those out. They're going to go to hellfire. How many? Ya Allah. He's going to say, from every thousand, it's 999. So from every thousand people, 999 are going to be the contingent of the hellfire to go to Jahannam. Only one person, so you got a one out of a thousand chance. Now that is going to be so severe and that's going to be such bad news for everybody. That it says that that is where Allah says in Surah Al-Hajj, verse 2, that's going to be the time when you'll see people as though they're intoxicated, but they're not really intoxicated, and this, the, the punishment of Allah is going to be very severe. That's the time when anybody who's pregnant, any woman who's pregnant is going to have a miscarriage, and that's when even young children, they're going to become gray-haired. Because if you, you're already in that really tormenting state, frightful state, and then the only chance you have is that out of, nine, out of 1,000, you only have 999. Sorry, one person out of that. Now, when people heard this, I mean, now in real life right now, when people heard it, their faces just changed. Like, what chance do we have? Like, what chance do we have to make it? So the Prophet Sallallahu made it very easy. How would you make it that easy? From every thousand one. Every thousand one. How, does, how, do you, how do you lighten that for us? How do you give some hope in there? The Prophet Sallallahu said that you know that 999 from the thousand, they're going to be from the Ya'juj, Ma'juj. And from you guys, it's going to be one. Wow, that just took a burden off. Ya'juj, Ma'juj is going to be huge. I don't know again how that, how that whole calculation is made. Wallahu alam. But then the Prophet Sallallahu said something. He said, you are among people. Just like that black hair, that one black strand on the side of a black ox or a bull, of a white ox or a bull. It just has one strand of hair. That's all. Or the opposite. You're that white strand on a black bull or a black buffalo or the other way around. And I am hoping, inni la arju, my hope is you are going to be a quarter of the people of paradise. We made takbir, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Then he said, no, no, one third. It's almost like Allah is giving him that news. He's learning more. So first he thought you're going to be a quarter. Then he's got the news. No, it's actually 
or he was so excited he just said quarter. Uh, and then he learned that no, it's one third. We made takbir again. Then he said, no, one half of paradise. Fakabarna. This is hadith related by Bukhari and Muslim. Ibn Abbas, another one, the Prophet sallallahu said something and he says, you are one portion from a thousand portions. So you've got a big chance to go in there. Now, there's a few things that we have to understand when you look at all of these narrations. These are hadith and a number of others which we've not mentioned today. They actually show that that means the majority of the children of Adam, if you, Yajud Majuj are the children of Adam. They're from one of the children of Nuh alayhi salam. They are human beings, right? That means the majority of the denizens of hellfire are, are children of Adam. It also indicates that those who've actually followed prophets, who've adhered and been good followers of prophets, they're going to be a minority compared to the majority. These are the conclusions we can draw from here. And those who do not follow the prophets, they're all going to be in hellfire. Except those that we can say, who've not had any kind of da'wah reach them, any kind of propagation or knowledge about Allah or His Messenger reach them. You know, there's difference of opinion about that. So those we can maybe take our own side. Otherwise, the majority of people are going to be in hellfire. So the majority of human beings are going to be in hellfire. Minority are going to be in paradise. That's kind of conclusion what we're drawing so far. Then, obviously, those who thought they were following a prophet, but things had been changed and they're not following the correct method of that prophet or the message of that prophet, they're also going to be in hellfire. Because Allah said in Surah Tuhud, verse 17, وَمَن يَكْفُرْ بِهِ مِنَ الْأَحْزَابِ فَالنَّارُ مَوْعِدُهُ and those who disbelieve in them from among the comrades or the groups, then hellfire is their place as well. Those people who, are, you know, who used to believe in a book, so the true believers of all the scriptures at their time when they were there, and those who believe in the sharia and so on, and correct deen from Allah, many of them are also going to start off in hellfire. Why? Munafiqeen. The munafiqeen are going to be in there. They're going to be, in fact, the worst of the people of hellfire. However, those who attribute themselves to the prophets and believers of prophets, both outwardly and internally, then there's two groups among them. There's going to be that one group who have been overcome by doubts. or uh, So they're, they're the people of bid'ah, the innov innovation bid'ah, the mu'tazila and the shi'ah and uh, the Murji'ah and the Khawarij and all of these other groups. You see, because we have the hadith that uh, the Prophet ﷺ said that my ummah is going to split up into 70 some, 70 plus groups. All of them are going to be in hellfire, meaning to be punished. They're not going to be in hellfire forever. These are not people who are kafir. They are from his ummah, but they've split up. So these are the unsaved sects. They have to go into hellfire. Right? These sects have to go into hellfire to be purified. Illa firqatun wahida, except that one group. So who are these? The majority of them, they've... Uh, uh, right. Now, among this one saved sect, there's, they're going, it, it, we're just kind of classifying it. So among now that, out of the 71, the one, right? 70 plus, the one is going to be supposedly in paradise. But out of them, there's people who followed their desires. And they followed and done those bad deeds which have been promised hellfire and punishment. That means from among them there's only another group who have not come under those warnings because they've not done any of those wrongs. And they're the ones who were very strongly on that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger you know, had, had said openly, internally, outwardly and they stayed away from uh, desires and doing wrong deeds and sins and so on and doubts and everything. They're going to be the minority, clearly. They're going to be the minority, meaning the awliya, like the real people who are awliya. Especially, they're going to be more of a minority as you get towards the end of time. They're going to be more of a minority. The Quran tells us actually that the majority of people in hellfire, uh, the majority of people are going to be people in hellfire in the beginning. Because they followed shaitan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Sabah, verse 20, 
ولقد صدق عليهم إبليس ظنه فاتبع فاتبعوه إلا فريقا من المؤمنين إبليس uh, has uh, you know إبليس is gonna kind of prove right his opinion they're gonna start following him except فريقا except just a group of the believers then Allah says Surah Sad verse eighty five لَأَمْلَأَنَّ جَهَنَّمَ مِنْكَ وَمِمَّنْ تَبِعَكَ مِنْهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ I'm going to surely fill hellfire up with you and those who follow you, all of them. I'm going to fill them up with hellfire. So, لا إله إلا الله. I think we will stop here. We'll continue from here. But just remember, this is shown the whole hierarchy and the classification that those people who are right to get into paradise straight away are a very small group of people. Anybody else who goes to paradise is going to be either forgiven or interceded for or whatever the case is, but they're going to be... That means the majority will definitely... And remember this for next week. The majority are going to start off in hellfire. Right? That's what we have understood so far. Only a minority are going to start off in paradise. And inshallah, we will now start discussing that more next week inshallah and we hope to also finish next week inshallah as well wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin jazakallah khair for listening may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and if you're finding this useful you know um, as they say do that like button and subscribe button and forward it on to others jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh